This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina, your host, and although I'm a trustee at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs and the president of the Grassroot Institute, the views that you hear myself or my guest express today are ours alone and don't represent any institution, which is going to make for some very interesting conversation. <laughs> you know, here in the islands, uh, there are so many needs for the Native Hawaiian people and for all of us. Uh, there's the need for housing, for jobs, the need for health. These are all very critical needs and they're being met in various ways. But there's one need that is extremely crucial for the future of Native Hawaiian people and for all people here in the state of Hawaii, and that's the need for good education. But what constitutes good education? Well, the good news today is I have somebody who has dedicated her life to educating others and who herself is a model of how to bring education from the past into the modern world and how to thrive in doing that. Her name is Verlianne Molina Wright. She is both an educator and an administrator. She has an excellent uh, background, not only in the topic matter of education, but in inspiring people across the world to live up to the highest standards of education. And today, she's our guest. So please welcome to the program someone I call Auntie Verlian. Auntie, aloha. aloha. So happy you're here with us today. Thank you. Thank and I need to say to you, how oli laha now, happy birthday, because very soon, in a few days, yes. you'll be how many years old? 75. Oh, congratulations. You look wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, where did you grow up? I, I was raised actually downtown on 4th Street until they put the freeway through and then we relocated to a first home right next to Bishop Museum. Well, how about that? Yeah. You know, for the sake of my guests today, I've chosen not to read through your very lengthy resume <laughs> because it is lengthy, but mm. it is very okay. incredible what you've mm. done in your lifetime. Mm. You're an educator, you're an administrator, you've traveled the world, you have helped to develop educational theory. You, in fact, are still in the very active world of administration. You're the chairman of the board of two organizations. Is that right? The American yes. Pacific Foundation. Pacific and American Kuna Foundation. Pacific American Foundation. And Hawaii Maoli. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, that is something. And yet you arrived here at the studio coming from the University of Hawaii at an educational conference. So when do you sleep? Uh, actually, when you get old, you don't need as much rest. So well, you'll find out when you do get old. <laughs> now, would you tell our viewers why education is so important? And as I said in the introduction, th there are many noble efforts to advance the Native Hawaiian people. And there's some political as well as uh, health-oriented, job-oriented, and so mm -hmm. forth. But what place does education have in all of this? Well, it first begins with my family. Uh, my, both my parents were, were born, you know, during the time of the Depression. Uh, they both lived on the island of Kauai. Um, my father uh, only achieved an eighth grade education, but he became um, a captain in the Merchant Marine and could sail anywhere in the world. And my mother, I think, would have been a wonderful teacher. And she was a housewife and raised all five of us, Wonderful. which was not an easy job. <laughs> so your parents influenced you. It was mm. in the home that your heart for education came about. And, and I know I asked you how important education is, but let, let's personalize that a bit. Mm -hmm. How important was education to you in terms of becoming what you've become today? You never know what your future looks like. You know, I, I, as children, five of us, Every Saturday, um, mom would take us to the library or art academy. And this is something that we grew up with uh, in not realizing in her own way she was trying to teach us education in the community. Well, you know, Auntie Verliane, I wonder if we had the same mother. <laughs> My mother never graduated from high school, but she took the lead in making sure that mm -hmm. each one of her, her five keiki got a strong education. And on the weekend, she would take us to the art academy. <laughs> <laughs> and if we behaved, we would get the 10 cents colored popcorn from Crest's store. And she was just a great motivator. If well, you didn't behave, that? you didn't get your popcorn. How about mm -hmm. that? You know, you have been an advocate for the advancement of Native Hawaiians, mm -hmm. and yet you have been remarkably international, global in your exposure to the arts, to learning, to science, and so forth. And from those days that you went to the Academy of Art, you've been very much yeah. exposed to the international. What really constitutes a good education for Hawaiians? I think a good human being. 
So it starts with something universal at yes, first. Yes, and in, in that um, all humanity, all natural resources, inanimate and animate, are valued. And not only in, on this earth, but throughout the universe. So there's something we have in common with the rest of humanity and the universe mm -hmm. that, that brings us a kind of unity that we begin with. Now, while you have advocated for Hawaiian identity, you've also integrated that identity with the modern world. In fact, the, uh, when I look at the title of one of your organizations, Pacific American <laughs> Foundation, uh, it beautifully integrates what some are now taking apart, yeah. and that is the, the relationship between what we are in the Pacific and as Hawaiians mm -hmm. and what we are in political structures as Americans. What are your thoughts about that? Well, Pacific American Foundation was formed by many graduates from Kamehameha mm -hmm. School. David Cooper was one of them. Many of these graduates went to the academies, the military academies, traveled all around the world, and were afraid that many of the students that left Hawaii uh, would not remember their cultural roots. And so they established in Virginia a uh, Pacific American Foundation for American and Pacific Islanders throughout the Pacific. Well, I want to ask you further, how important is it to understand our roots, so to speak, our indigenous origins? Well, when, when I work uh, with indigenous people from around the world, mm -hmm. um, it has been uh, an education process. Uh, we come from uh, education at Kamehameha Schools in the University of Hawaii in Manoa. I was fortunate to have a, a global education at UCLA. I was the only Hawaiian in the College of Education, and I was 31 years old, and I was very lonely and sad. But I did not dare fail my family, and I know I had an obligation to come home with the credentials, and I did. Ironically, my interest was in business economics education, so my dissertation was on the hotel industry. <laughs> and this is how I met George Conahilly, Dr. Oh, Conahilly. Oh, how about that? Mm -hmm. Now, George Conahilly, he's the author of a book called Ku Kanaka, yeah. and uh, I know of your fond appreciation mm -hmm. for him. Mm -hmm. in, in a course in the philosophy department that I have taught at the Hawaii Pacific University, mm -hmm on Hawaiian philosophy, I've required the reading of that oh, book yeah. because George Kanahele understands the, the mm. indigenous values of Hawaii and so forth. And yet George, like yourself, was firmly committed to business advancement, mm -hmm. to tourist mm -hmm. development, mm -hmm. to many of these things in the modern world. Mm -hmm. And how do you bring them together? Because you, you want to have an education I hear from you for our keiki mm -hmm. that is steeped in our heritage, in the indigenous origins, and yet you want them to be connected in a bridge to the modern world and much a part of it. Well, I, I think, um, you know, Hawaiians were marginalized, many indigenous people, because their language was not written. And so the focus on content uh, was an area from Western society where you had to be competitive. You had to understand content and you had to be able to use it to your advantage to get educated and to become employed. Um, but when you study from an indigenous lens, you're looking at context, which is more than what's written. It's what's seen and not seen, as the Queen said. And this is where I, over a period of time, has literally woven the vili lay of how one perceives the importance of education, not only for now, but in the next hundred years. And so having the foresight of our ali'i to set their trust aside for the beneficiary of the Hawaiian people, imagine now that we have the responsibility to grow that trust. And we can no longer have this entitlement uh, perspective of uh, being a beneficiary. So that's you know. an interesting statement, no longer have this entitlement mm -hmm. perspective. You, you of being a beneficiary. Mm -hmm. That word beneficiary is a very important word, uh, especially at the institution you taught at, Kamehameha <laughs> Schools, where we learn and I have learned as an alumnus and as my four children who are alumni have learned that there was a benefactor, Bernice Pawahi Bishop, the princess, and she left a legacy and we are beneficiaries mm -hmm. of that legacy. I see that term also at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs <laughs> because our beloved beneficiaries come to the table <laughs> and w we as trustees are mm -hmm. committed to serving them mm -hmm. and uh, our whole mission is to advance the 
welfare of our beneficiaries. But you have some caution, I detect, yeah. on, on an exclusive use of that word beneficiary. Well, I, I think what are your thoughts? The, the mind shift has to occur in, in today's And what mind shift is the, that? Of today's society that um, you not only have to take a look at a beneficiary context, but you also have to grow out uh, the trust uh, resources to service more individuals without having to keep tapping the resources yourself. In other words, there has to be a shift from being a beneficiary to becoming, a if benefactor. you will, a benefactor. Absolutely. Now, now that is something that is news, I think, or a new way of thinking. You say a mind shift mm -hmm. for some people because while it is wonderful to have these legacies left for us, the elite trusts and the, the benefits of the uh, Department of Hawaiian Homelands yes. and the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, when we educate our young people, we want them not only to be beneficiaries, we want them to aspire to be benefactors. Absolutely. Now, how would we motivate? Well, I, I think when I took over, for example, both the Pacific American Foundation, uh, we already had a, a tremendous education model from preschool to PhD in marine science and environmental sciences and natural resource management. But we also knew that, and my hypothesis is by 2019, there will be less and less revenue available for nonprofit organizations, including government. And so we need to take a look at social enterprise models in which we can generate our own income and become benefactors ourselves to become grantors to other community organizations that we work with. The hardest shift with Hawaii Maui, which was an organization established to help Hawaiian civic clubs and Hawaiian community organizations, was to move into a for-profit, non-profit, public, philanthropic partnership instead of just simply being a non-profit entity. Now you're talking about the organizational mm -hmm. level, that we mm -hmm. need to, to move from being organizations that are begging for money, so yes. to speak, going mm -hmm. to the legislature mm -hmm. or going to the public, and instead being coming organizations that are entrepreneurial, Absolutely. that are able to succeed mm -hmm. financially and then become donors, basically. Would you say this also applies in the personal life of individuals as we educate? Well, and, and in, in particular for the state of Hawaii mm -hmm. and the American government, the American nation, and nations that are free. We have a responsibility, I think, for the first time in looking at our trust funds, looking at government funds, that we don't have all the resources to do what we used to do. If that is the case, then how do we harness new resources to complement, supplement, extend the reach of our current entities? It, it sounds as though you see resource building as being mm -hmm. key to the accomplishment of any yes. educational mission, mm -hmm. that, that it's not merely the expression of a philosophy or the uh, teaching of content, that we have to be deeply concerned about the building of an institution of yes. education. And I use the word very broadly, institution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think also that, you know, I was pondering in preparation for this program, what is the difference between charity and dependency? We do want to have a social enterprise. We do want to be able to improve the lot of our communities that we live in. But we also have a responsibility to teach the individuals that we work with to become entrepreneurial themselves instead of dependent. And I look back on the history of the great society and all the things that we thought were good things for America, and yet those programs have built tremendous amount of dysfunctional and dependency within entities that have not been able to survive and succeed. So you see that education mm -hmm. should definitely raise people out of this yes. condition of yes. dependency into what we might call a self-determinism. And when we come back from this break, I'm going to ask for some of your loving views as a kupuna uh, on efforts of the Hawaiian people to achieve self-determinism. Certainly education needs to be part of that, mm -hmm. but uh, you have some thoughts to share. I do. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, my, my guest today, Auntie Verlian Molina Wright, who is a preeminent educator and scholar, somebody who's, donate, who's given her life toward building the education of so many others. We'll be right back on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together in just a moment. Don't go away. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Planning all week for the day of 
of the big game. Watching at home just doesn't feel the same. Number one on the list is who's gonna drive. It's nice to know you're gonna get home alive. Plan for fun and responsibility. Choose a DT. Captain of our team. It's the DT. For every game day, a sign. Guys, don't forget to check me out right here, The Prince of Investing. I'm your host, Prince Dykes. Each and every Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Hawaii time, I'm going to be right here. Stop by here from some of the best investment minds across the globe. And real estate, finances, stocks, hedge funds, managers, all that great stuff. Thank you. Welcome back to Hawaii Together. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute and a trustee at, at large in the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Now, one of the most blessed sayings that we have here in the state of Hawaii is a pule kako. Let us pray together. And I'm especially fascinated, always have been, with the kako part. That means when we pray, let's pray you and me, he and she, we and they. All together, it's not exclusive. It's something that's totally integrative and inclusive of all people. Well, one of the things that we believe at the Grassroot Institute is that we should also a hana kako. Let's work together. Let's work together for a better economy, government, and society. Think of how terrible it would be if we didn't work together. And that's one of the reasons I've invited as my guest today, Verlianne Molina Wright, because she has shown a real spirit of being able to bring people together to cross cultures in order to work for a better government, a better economy and society. And that's partly what we've been talking about in terms of education. Auntie Verlianne, mm. you, you have been observing for many decades <laughs> <laughs> efforts to advance the Native Hawaiian people, particularly self-determinism, which is sometimes called the independence movement or the sovereignty movement. And uh, I know that you have cheered people on, but at the same time, you've had some thoughts and some concerns. What might that be? Well, I, I think that in, in terms of the sovereignty movement, there are many, many um, areas of agreement uh, based on the history that we were not taught. Um, but there is also the context of which we live in today. And so how do we uh, bridge the arching together uh, and whether it becomes parallel or integrated um, and that this kind of discussion continues to take place, I think, in a cultural context. And so um, I wanted to share two stories. Uh, working with the Maoris in New Zealand, it took a Maori 10 years to have an advisor for a PhD program. And when we came in and we formed the World Indigenous Nations Higher Education Consortium with nine nations, in five years, 500 Maoris were sent abroad and they came home with PhDs and they took back control Marvelous. of their educational system. With that language, culture, protocol, ceremony, restoration of land, economic resources. And so with that in mind, we also took a look at working with First Nations people as well as Native American Indians. And it is through those contexts that I came back and reviewed what I should be doing uh, as a kupuna, and in particular, as a Hawaiian kupuna. Now, that's where the kupuna part comes in, not merely educational administrator, because mm -hmm. in uh, some of these stories which you had shared with me before, some of the students were very discouraged. They, mm -hmm. they, they didn't know how they could really hold on to or be true to their indigenous past and their heritage, and, mm -hmm. and even questioned whether they should pursue the, this Western notion <laughs> of a PhD, how did you kupuna them? Well, this was a National Science Foundation grant. Uh, we were funded with the Indigenous Education Institute. It's Navajo uh, driven. And um, we were asked, uh, I was asked to fly up and meet with students that were PhD students in physics, extraordinary Native American students. And they wanted to know more about Hawaii. And in particular, exactly the same question that you asked us. And so we did different cultural activities, and the students knew ceremony, they knew language, they knew protocol, they tilled the land, they believed they could make a living off the land. They were physics majors, and they were in a Western university. All 12 of them wanted to quit, and they were in their second year, so NSF flew us down to work with these students. 
And in the ending, they said, Auntie, you never asked us a question. I said, I have only one question for you. Why are you so sad? And they cried, and they cried, and they cried. And one student said, I remember my grandfather holding the hand of his grandfather when he was shot in the head for the bounty of an Indian mm. scalp. I came back and asked myself about historical trauma. I went to Pokai Bay where I was working with the homeless there and I asked myself as an alumni of Kamehameha schools, how could I have missed this? And so I started to do the research on epigenetics in DNA. And I found out that in epigenetics, this is the code for the DNA, although Western science looks at the 3% that makes up the DNA. In the epigenes, when genocide occurs, or trauma occurs in the brain, um, the adrenaline is completely destroyed. And this coding is recorded from the beginning of the time of those incidences. And so I ask myself, to what extent would the overthrow of the monarchy also have bearing, even though these individuals probably don't have the context or reference. And so I started looking at the epigenes and also the coding, and then I found out that in the epigenes, our histories and who we are are still there. Mm. So our ancestral knowledge of our kupuna are still there. And so what do we do? We need to restore it. We need to call it back. And I've been so fortunate to work with Kukani Loko to begin learning about the sacred space of where Ali'i were born. Well, that is something. That, yeah, that, isn't that th something? Th this is really something. And, you know, uh, not everyone is going to necessarily agree that, that there is a biological basis mm -hmm. to historical mm -hmm. trauma. And not everyone is going to agree with the sociology that mm -hmm. uh, actually people groups go through that. But uh, what I, I love about your story is that your focus ultimately was how we move beyond. Mm -hmm. And you see, one of the concerns that I have sometimes is that regardless of what the story in the past was, mm -hmm. we mustn't let our future yes. be held hostage mm -hmm. to what may have happened in the past. And, and what are some of the ways you see okay. us moving forward? Kind of bursting at the seams here. Um, so I've, I've come up with a, a curriculum model uh, in which content is important, but because of the internet, we're just imploding. I mean, you know, when you look at research studies, there are 8,000 research studies in cancer every day. There, right. There are 400 YouTube videos every day. The mass of data is going to have to learn how to be synthesized. And I think research, reading, writing, arithmetic, and research is going to be a very, very, very important skill for our people. Uh, and then content is taking place in context. So Aloha Aina movement, Malama Aina movement, uh, it, it's the awareness of applying content in our environment. Well, with that, what is missing, and it has bothered me immensely, and now I come out and I feel comfortable saying it, is that we need to address spirituality in everything we do. And so within the DOE system, using the term consciousness is sort of a metaphor for spirituality. And so content, context, and spirituality to me, that just raises our level of thinking and perspective uh, in such a way that we take a look at complexity, that we as individual humanity have many, many world views, and this complexity allows for diversity of thought. Right. Now, you talk about spirituality, and some people may think, oh, there's religion, mm -hmm. and we can't have religion in the schools, mm -hmm. whether it is... Christian religion or whether it's ancient Hawaiian religion because the quote unquote wall of separation mm -hmm. that exists mm -hmm. between church and state. But when I listen to you carefully, I, I'm not hearing religion. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing what you said was complexity. Mm -hmm. that, that the, the, the consciousness. The consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're talking about so. a dimension of humanity mm -hmm. and it doesn't necessarily require us to call it mm -hmm something that dogma, traditionally yeah. mm -hmm. has been dogmatic mm -hmm. or, or religious mm -hmm. and so forth. But it's an openness to all that there is out there in the complexity of who we are. Mm -hmm. And we, I go back to what you said at the beginning, that there is a commonality to yeah. humanity, that, mm -hmm. that we can't see ourselves as merely isolated with our own tradition and our story. We're part of the, the great 
humanity of the universe. So in, in that complexity, then we really become simple. <laughs> and, and, and that's the irony of it all, is that in the simplicity, we realize that we are all interconnected. We are all interrelated. And in, in that simplicity, we also have a chance to reflect on where lo lokahi, where things form and behave. And so with my tutu, and I wish I listened more when I was little, but when she tucked us in bed during the summers when we visited her, she would say, aloha, I, I love you with aloha. And her definition was, I give you my final breath of life. Mm, that's that so was wonderful. her aloha. aloha. Yeah. You know. Before we leave, I, I, I want to also pick up on a conversation you and I had earlier mm. today. That there are things of our past that are worth cherishing. They nurture us. And there are some things that we have to recognize needed to evolve into change. One of those you mentioned that's dear to you was the idea that women should be subjugated to men, which had been codified in the uh, kapu system of the Hawaiians. Uh, and you had some thoughts on that. Maybe we could... Yeah, um, you know, I, I think that one of the movements sometimes in the Hawaiian movement is that the role of the female is not clear. I, I really think if you look at Kahamanu, or if you look at my mother and my tutu, there is no question about who ran the household. And tutu would just raise her eyebrow and you know exactly what that <laughs> That's meant. That's right. And so I think that it, in this sharing together, there are two things that I'm concerned about leadership. Uh, one is the role of women as leaders in the Hawaiian community, because I think that we have much to contribute alongside our male counterparts. But the second thing is that there's also an arrogance that has begun to show itself about fluency in language. And I have seen in different community meetings where Kupuna will ask the individual speaking in Olelo, would you mind translating what you said? And these young ones will shame the Kupuna for mm. not uh, being able to speak the language. And well, I'm glad you, you gave your loving Kapuna thoughts to that. And oh, I did, so, in absolutely no uncertain term. It's so unfortunate that we've ended our time to, uh, uh, here in the studio. But what I hear you saying is that the, there needs to be aloha, not arrogance. Yeah, and the Kapuna paved the way for these young ones. You have been an Thank ideal you. kupuna. I you are a role model to so many. Auntie Verlianne, much you. aloha, much Thank mahalo you. for being with us. Thank My you. guest today, Verlianne Molina Wright, a superb educator, but a deeply loving kupuna for all of us. I'm Kili'i Akina on Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Aloha.